How's everyone doing? Thank you so much for joining us, Jeremy. So I'm sure we'll have a very interesting conversation today. So let's begin. The process of creation of music is all about innovation, strategy, collaboration, presentation, leadership. So can you share something about how important is innovation and strategy in composing music, probably by running us through some of your personal experiences? OK. Well, I think uh, when we compose music, there are two, two particular approaches. One is if we are doing it because we just want to create a nice piece of art, a nice piece. It doesn't matter to us whether or not it's successful and well received. And the second piece is when we are writing uh, because someone has asked us for a particular project, either compose a song for a singer uh, who's releasing a new album, or for example, if you ask to write music for a movie or something like that. Uh, and in that case, then you have to kind of uh, uh, you know, direct your, your, your creativity and your innovation uh, according to uh, parameters given to you. So artists like to be able to do both. As far as strategy is concerned, it's the same thing. Uh, when we look for a particular piece that we're trying to compose, uh, we try to make sure we create, take someone on a listening journey, whether it's three minutes or five minutes, and make sure that, like any good story, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. So, so uh, I guess, you know, in that way, there's a bit of a, a correlation between uh, that and, uh, you know, I guess, the providing service or product to someone. Absolutely. Very interesting. Thank you. So, jazz is a great metaphor for working together. Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong had said in a personal message to you in 2017 that Singapore's founding Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew used to describe the way he worked with his close colleagues as being like a jazz band, each performing his own part and improvising freely, but mindful of the overall effect and coordinating closely with the other players. So tell us something about the role of collaboration in creating music and what can go wrong and right when you collaborate? Well, firstly, there are two quite different leadership styles when running a jazz band or running a symphony orchestra. And uh, as mentioned uh, by Yasmin, uh, uh, founding prime minister used two metaphors. He actually publicly talked about an orchestra where the leader is like uh, uh, leading a, a group of people to do things in a particular way. And uh, he didn't say this publicly, but privately, that a, a, a jazz band is a little bit different in that there's more democracy and allow the, the other members of his team to pretty much do their own thing. Uh, I think with an orchestra, uh, it's very hard to not run it like a dicta dictatorship because you have 90 musicians, and if there are 90 other ideas uh, during the concert, you know, it will, it will be a bit of, a, of chaos. So there's a little less play, although classical music is wonderful to listen to, than there is with jazz. And as a, as a band leader, a jazz band leader, it's very important in choosing. Sometimes people come up to me and say, wow, you really know how to control your musicians. I say, no, I don't control my musicians. The first key is to choose the right musicians to play with so I, have to, I can say as little as possible to the musicians. And I think that's also a correlation to uh, like in HR really because you know if you choose the right person if you hire the right person you'll have very few problems going forward uh, so with, with a jazz band I think that uh, first thing is to choose the right people to work with people who are innovative who are able to extemporize and uh, think out of the box practice uh, lateral or heuristic thinking and then uh, have them in your team so then as a leader you're nothing more than a, a bit of a mark like a, like a captain of a, of a football uh, team, you just marshal people. You don't really have to keep shouting instructions on what to do. Thanks, interesting. So that brings me to the similarity between work and jazz. Could you take us through that now? I think it's the, the, the difference between work and jazz or work and your job. I think we talked about. Yeah, work and job. Yeah. yeah. So I always tell uh, musicians, because now it's not that easy to uh, depend completely on, uh, on music uh, for a living. So I think there's a, there's a difference between someone's work and someone's job. For example, someone's work could be, uh, someone's job could be driving a taxi from Monday to Friday, and then his work, which is really your life mission aspect, uh, could be helping out at the Salvation Army on Saturday and Sunday. So same thing for a musician. For me, uh, I guess my job, I used to joke that the way I make my most money is to be invited to do a corporate function where they want to put my name on the invitation card 
so that I can then be ignored for two hours. So then my work, which is my life mission, is when playing a little jazz club with 100 people, giving me 100% attention. So I think if we correlate that to, uh, you know, working in, you know, some people, they have a particular thing that they consider their life mission, but maybe that's not what they can do to pay the bills. So then they have to have a job, take a job. And then later on, as you go on, like now as a musician, I'm lucky that my work and my job is more or less the same thing. And I can make a living uh, doing my work or my life mission. True, that meaningful work is what matters today as well. So you were talking about leadership and how important that is. So can you, you know, take a reference from jazz and tell me about what kind of leadership qualities are most relevant today? Well, I, I think the, the main thing is uh, people nowadays have got are very well trained, very well educated, even in music, you know, people, uh, it's not just uh, people playing without any proper training, there's a lot of opportunities to study uh, music and study jazz, even take a degree, a master's degree and doctorate in jazz studies, for example, which I don't have, but uh, uh, I think that the, uh, the fact that it's, you, you find that the level of competency for musicians is very high now. So as a leader, you know, once you gather the correct team, you know, uh, and not be distracted by other attributes of a person which has no relevance in you getting your work done, uh, then uh, really that's, uh, that's the way that I would go as far as uh, being a leader of a jazz band. And uh, uh, running some companies myself uh, is the same thing. Uh, you know, I have a wonderful team working with me at the Jazz Association Singapore. Uh, and... and it's amazing to see the team being so organic and uh, not needing a whole lot of direction other than saying that we, we're going to do this project. So that brings me to uh, what kind of learnings can leaders take from music and jazz? And you also spoke about how silence is the wellspring of creativity. Can you highlight a few things about that also? Sure. I think it will, let me just address this thing about what I say uh, quite often, which is uh, silence or stillness is the wellspring of creativity. Uh, you know, we live in a world that's always so busy, right? We're always on our phones, we always have messaging. Uh, I don't really know how we get our work done, to be honest with you, because we're doing nothing but, but just communicating, which is a big part of any organization. But I think as a leader or, or, or any, any particular job that you do, we need to find that space to be quiet and to be still, whether we have a meditation practice or whether we sit down and intently listen to music whether it's jazz or any kind of that stillness is wonderful you'll find that when you sit down for example you know i sometimes i don't know i have to do this i have to do that but i really can't think what it is when i'm practicing the piano which i still do every day for at least 90 minutes um, a lot of uh, thoughts arise that normally are just completely blocked out by the the chaos of the day so i think to find uh, those moments of stillness whether uh, being quiet in the morning with your morning coffee and not talking and not turning your phone on first and just be able to allow your own thought to be very still and, and then thoughts and ideas will actually emerge because, again, uh, stillness or, uh, is really the wellspring of creativity. And what kind of difference would you see between an ensemble leader of jazz and a classical leader? Well... As I mentioned a bit earlier, you know, the, the classical ensemble is a little bit more dictatorial. Because, okay, the, firstly, the difference between, say, a classical musician and a jazz musician is a little bit like the difference between someone who gives a speech that is totally prepared, whether reading from a script or teleprompter uh, or, or memorizing a speech. That's more like the classical musician. And nothing wrong with that. There's also a very high, high skill, actually, to be able to do that. And then they infuse the emotion and the energy to a prepared speech. So a classical musician has to play the notes that is on the, on, on the music manuscript. They cannot veer from it, but then they infuse their own uh, passion and so on or emotion in the speech. But a jazz musician is like a speaker who speaks from cue cards, right? Who maybe has five points and can speak for one hour. Uh, and, and, and that's another special skill. So you have to have a wealth of knowledge a wealth of, uh, uh, of resource that you can just call, call up on. So a little bit like me speaking now, I, I, we didn't really prepare this, you know. So I'm speaking a little bit more like a jazz musician than a classical musician. 
Very interesting, thank you. So you did speak about marketability and how musicians don't know how to market themselves. But in today's world, it's very important to you know, earn money as well. So that dichotomy is always there. So you know, how can one create a balance between marketability and creative integrity? Well, in the old days, many artists and painters didn't care about money, right? Actually, in a, you know, innately, art is not actually commercial. When you create art, your intention is to just bear your soul or to reflect the thoughts and feelings of uh, society. So in a sense, art is not really a marketable product in and of itself. But at the end of the day, artists have to make money, right? So 300 years ago, uh, Beethoven and Wagner survived because they were living in the, in the royal courts and they were given an allowance, given a house, even as their children were, were taken care, their education was taken care of. And all they had to do is to create wonderful music. Nowadays, you know, there's not so much the, uh, that, but you know, you have, to, uh, you have to, art has been commercialized. So basically, you have to find this balance. If you want to make art your living, then you have to find a way to balance the things that you create that may not have any commercial value today. Maybe uh, 50 years from now, people will be paying, you know, millions for your painting. But right now, you just create it because you want to create something. But at the same time, to sustain yourself, you have to be able to apply. So it's really art for art's sake and art for business sake. Yeah. And so finally, tell me, what key learnings can, you know, the world of work learn from the world of music? And, you know, what impact can it have on the future of work for you? Well, there's a joke that a jazz musician is a very funny person because he can spend four hours playing at a jazz club for his job, I mean, for a living. To do. And then after that, go to someone else's gig at 11 o'clock or 12 midnight and play for free for two hours with his friends. Uh, I think we need to find the joy of, find a work that gives us joy so that although we uh, do that in the office all day and we slog at it all day, uh, it's something that we love as well. So to find something that we love to do I think it's, 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 quite a, it's quite a blessing. And I think more people are finding purpose and meaning in their work. And I think that's very important. Thank you. And one final word on what leadership lessons would you, you know, give to people from the world of music to the world of work? Well, I think basically the world of music, the main thing, as I've said a couple of times, or, you know, is to find, find the right people to work with you and be very astute about choosing the right people to be in your team. And once you do that, then you'll find that, uh, you know, it doesn't feel like a job. You know, it feels like you're creating something together and it feels uh, that there's purpose and, there's, and there's, there's meaning to what you do. And then building communities, when you build your teams, to build a community of people who feel that they are doing something that's going to help the world and help the people that you are serving. Great, thank you. That was really interesting. Uh, we'll move on to questions from the audience. Do we have any questions from the audience here? Hmm. Not really. So uh, thank you, Jeremy. It was a very exciting conversation. And thank you for showing us a totally different side of music today. Uh -huh.